Christ. Good morning, everybody. We just have a massive crowd here this morning. It's amazing. We've had a couple of people drop by. One, two, three. There's six people in the room. <laughs> Some of us had been vaccinated, so we're going crazy now. <laughs> Hi. So this week, um, Center of Spiritual Living had its annual convention. And, of course, most years you go someplace. This year we did not. It was online. Uh, but as I was recalling, about four or five years ago, it took place in New Orleans. And it took place the week before Mardi Gras. And I thought, well, that shouldn't affect us anyway. I mean, it's a <laughs> <laughs> Mardi Gras next week. And, and, of course, our hotel was just on the edge of the French Quarter. I'm sure Mardi Gras wouldn't have had any effect of, uh, of our experience at the hotel. But what I noticed is that, um, let's see, I think it's arrived Sunday, and then we left Friday, and then, of course, Mardi Gras officially was Tuesday. Each day, you know, like the, the pulse of the neighborhood and energy just increased it exponentially each time. And our hotel was on one of the main parade routes. And, and by the time I left, I couldn't believe what I was seeing in the streets. Um, <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> and I, I, I've seen a lot of things. But, um, but the other thing about that, which I, I'm told, is that, of course, you have all this buildup of excitement and parades and doing things that you don't want people to know about. And, and then... Tuesday is Fat Tuesday. You know, it's it's the, the end of it all, the, the big excitement, and it all stops at midnight <clears throat> for a very specific reason. So this whole party was to kind of like get it all out of your system before you go into the 40-day observance of Lent, which, of course, ends with Easter. And if you weren't raised in any sort of Christianity, you may not be really clear what Lent is about. It, it's can be a very sacred practice if you allow it. It can be a sacred practice if you are a Christian, but it can be a sacred practice if you're not a Christian. In fact, you can have a completely secularized Lent because the whole point of this, as funny as we're looking at the theme that's being established here, is to looking at transition and transformation, but having a period of time where you do some really <coughs> deep work of what that transition should be. And it's, it's not, and it's really not going someplace. It's uncovering what's there. I mean, I like the lyrics from the song that R.L. sang, uh, that <coughs> sang of that in the quiet we're looking for God and myself. So it can be a process, <coughs> excuse me, where we allow ourselves through some introspection to take off all these layers or these layers of things that just don't need to be in there. Now, last week I talked a bit about what I was calling your inner critic. And this week I'm going a little further talking about our, just our, our inner conflict our, of, of what we allow to go on and here, the choices we make internally and all the just stuff that happens that, quite frankly, we need to make a conscious effort to just let go and be done with. And that's actually what life can be, rigged, whether you are Christian or non-Christian or doesn't even matter, of going through a period of time of these 40 days of saying, what is really the truth of who I am, and let's let go of everything else. And, of course, being raised as a Catholic, we were really big on Lent, but I really weren't looking at it as a deep practice, at least as children. This, the way that we were, were told to practice is that you're just supposed to fast in some way. In other words, give up something you really like. And that somehow there is a God that just really would be pleased if little Johnny Moreland gave up the Zumba bubblegum for 40 days. I mean, you know, and of course it was funny, here's the rule. So, so but you, you, were, you were given a day off on Sunday, so imagine me with literally like 10 pieces of bazooka gum, bubblegum in my mouth. And I, I've really got to go to it for all week. And this is actually true. I would do that. But it's like somehow that there's going to be an inner process of release because like, okay, I'm giving up bubble gum or putting sugar in my coffee. Oh, that's scary. Um, but there's two levels of, of release and of uh, giving up that we can look at that is a deep practice. Again, there is no deity that is just saying, you know, give up ham sandwiches. And that would be really great. So first of all, there's a release or a giving up of things that you like and 
And secondly, things that, quite frankly, our inner existence is dependent on giving up things that we no longer need. So giving up things that you like, this really takes us to the Buddhist practice of non-attachment. There is nothing wrong with great things that are alive. There's nothing wrong with the celebration of Mardi Gras and all that goes on there. But you have to ask yourself, what is my attachment to these things that I like? So it's not the doing or having or experiencing, but what's the attachment to it? Have we in some ways made certain things so important that we almost get you know, like nervous if it's like, oh, I can't have this anymore for some reason. Or, I mean, don't you, we all have things that maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago, whatever, that some physical thing in our life was so important, and then we realized, why did I think that was important? Why was I so attached to it? Why did I think I had to have that part of my daily life or monthly life or whatever part of my life? So that's part of this practice, to, to necessarily not just give up things that we like, is to look at, what's my attachment to these things that I like in my life? Do I give them more importance than they should have? Should I, you know, renegotiate my relationship with them? So that's one big thing. So it's not just about not doing it. It's looking at the reason why you think you should do it, if that makes any sense. So you could actually, you could have a great line practice of still doing those things, but to really looking at, what's my attachment to it? Why do I think I need it? And would my life really be negatively affected if I just didn't do it for a while or have it for a while? I mean, really, to look at that. But the other aspect is to look at things that we really need to let go and to really delve into those things during this time and ask ourselves, why do I continually why do we continually make the choices to include those things, knowing that they not, aren't in our best interest? Why do I still choose to believe things about myself that aren't true? And it's a time to go into a more silent mode to ask ourselves those questions, to, to renegotiate these, you know, just small choices. And if you're really wondering even where to begin, well, I know nothing about Lynn. How can I really start to bring new ideas into my consciousness as well as releasing on um, a way that would be interesting or, um, I guess, easy, easy to understand? So uh, if you don't go to our Facebook page, Light of the Mountains, um, I'm starting to post something by through here by Reverend Edward Viune. Every year he has a, um, a program he does with his, his center in some way. He calls it Give It Up for Good. So it's a 40-day period, and he posts in, on their Facebook, and I share that, um, a daily thing. And so let me just read the last one. So let me just show you, if you go to our Facebook page, what you'll find every day. So this is day four, uh, called Expression. Today I give up the idea that I don't know how to express myself. I love being an expression of life, and I honor my unique contribution. I am awake to my feelings, emotions, and ideas, and all is well in my world. So imagine if you just made it your Latin practice to tune in and go check us out on Facebook every day, and you got the daily little practice. And through that day, that was your practice. See, it can be as simple as that, to entertain something different. And for it's about expression. So that's a suggestion. But it gets down to choices. Sometimes large choices, but they begin with the small choices. And I further this week uh, read um, Michael Singer's book, The Surrender Experiment. I you know, shared a little bit with that last week, and I'm reading it a little bit each week because I'm just kind of taking a little bit in and seeing where he went with his transformation, spiritually as a transformation. And the part that I read this week, it was so interesting and so great for this, this Latin period of um, what new choices can we make and actually how we at times, at times often, uh, lead ourselves into a corner to what I call false choices, that we think it has to either be this or that, 
or nothing else, and we have an opinion of what this and that is, when, and then we get ourselves all messed up about, well, if it's not that, it's that, and then what else could I possibly do? So, um, in this part of this book, he was in his early um, 20s, his early 70s, and he was just starting to come to a spiritual awakening. So, do you remember last week, he asked himself, or he had realized that he had this voice in his head, you know, as we all say, that monkey mind chatter, and his beginning of a spiritual practice and journey was asking the question, what would it be like if that voice was silenced? And so he very diligently, as we move into the part that I read this week, um, went into spiritual practice. And I mean, in a way that most of us don't, and how probably many of us are envious of other people that do in this way. I mean, to the point that um, it was going into a deep state where he felt that he truly left his body. And uh, I remember one of my teachers in school of ministry was a Buddhist, and he would call this a samadhi state, meaning that you truly go into your oneness with the universe and not just intellectually have an idea of what that oneness is, but you are it. You experience it. And I remember my, uh, my teacher said that it was very, um, you know, it's very tempting to leave the physical world behind and to go into these samadhi states because it was amazing. I mean, you were not not only one with the universe, but you were the universe. So it seems like Michael Singer had, had reached that state. That, and I'm sure, you know, so many of us get envious of someone and think, my gosh, I just can't imagine what that would be like. But that was contrasted with his day-to-day life. In fact, he said in this book that he felt when he got up each and every day, he had the choice of going into what he said, the consciousness of heaven, meaning samadhi, or meditation, or the consciousness of hell, meaning his everyday life. And he said it it seemed like as he was getting higher and higher levels of consciousness in his spiritual practice, that his life was falling apart more and more. I mean, he got a divorce. He was living, of course, it's the early 70s, living in this VW van, looking for places to park. That he was in a, had been in a, a graduate program, but I can't remember what it was, and something that he didn't feel like he really even wanted to do anymore. And it's kind of a held over, I guess, hippie from the 60s would go into class with torn jeans and barefoot and long hair, and like, what am I doing? So again, he's got this experience of just, what's my life doing? It's falling apart. Or, I can go to meditation and be one with the universe. This is a false choice. It's just one you know, it is a false choice. But so often, I think we fall into that idea that I have said, and I, many people have told me, if I could only have a deeper spiritual practice, God, my life would be so much better. Now, eventually it does. But at first, you can be led into this false choice. It seems like, at least this is my experience, that once I entered a higher state or just getting spiritually my life together, at least in my opinion a little bit more, my quote-unquote regular life, regular life had a way of just falling apart. And again, I, on a smaller scale, experienced that false choice of, should I maybe stop spiritual practice? Because this is getting really bad over here. So, we need to work ourselves out of false choice into a different way of looking at this. That is not just one or the other, because we have this this kind of idea, I think, in spiritual practice, where we, we, regardless of what your spiritual practice is or religious practice, that somehow here we are ascending to a heavenly experience, whether you think it's an actual place or it's a state of consciousness, that somehow we are as kind of floating above all this, and that no longer were all this nasty stuff bother me anymore. But actually, I believe it's somewhat of the opposite. Instead of ascending from Earth into a heavenly experience, I believe we are supposed to, instead, bring this experience of heaven into right where we are. That we don't heal and let go of where we are with just kind of like brushing it aside, that through making 
different choices, even very seemingly minor choices, and right, quite frankly, the mess that we're in, that we start to bring heaven down to earth. And I think this is how shift of consciousness always works. And I think just we have been probably for the last few years, especially this last year or so with the with COVID, we're doing Lent big time. You know, we're being given the opportunity to look at this isn't working. And it's time to, in a sense, not to escape it, but in a sense, ask ourselves, how can we bring the experience of heaven to right where we are? Especially at a time when it can seem that it's less and less possible. That it seems like many of us are going, I know, more out of our mind, more in our corners, more polarized. And it seems like, no, I really want to transcend and go to Samadhi because I just want to leave this all behind. But actually, the way in is to bring heaven into earth in the simplest decisions that we make. And it starts from within. It starts with just a simple practice I read with you from Reverend Edward that, that we're sharing on Facebook. That, so, so imagine that we are doing a silent practice with one, that we're just pulling back a little bit to look what's going on in there. And then realize what, that when that stuff really does come up, because that's when it seems to come up when we're quiet a little bit of times. I think we bring sometimes too much activity into our world to try to, to get away from those things that, that, that we shouldn't be listening to or we, we're tired of listening to. So practice starts with things that are simple. So I went to, I, I guess, the, um, the expert on Lent this week, uh, the Pope. <laughs> if anyone knows about Lent, it's the Pope. <laughs> Lent's least what the nuns told me in, in grade school. Um, from Pope Francis, and I, I really love Pope, Pope, Pope Francis. And, he, and, he's, and here he has a little thing, and I've actually attached this to the live stream um, event this, today. So once you get out of it, you can print this out. And it says, do you want to fast this? Wait, do you want to fast this Lent? And Pope Francis says this. Fast from hurting words and say kind words. Fast from sadness and be filled with gratitude. Fast from anger and be filled with patience. Fast from pessimism and be filled with hope. Fast from worries and have trust in God. Fast from complaints and contemplate simplicity. Fast from pressures and be prayerful. Fast from bitterness. Fill your hearts with joy. Fast from selfishness and be compassionate. Fast from grudges and be reconciled. Fast from words. Be silent and listen. So when we start to begin this inner practice, as I said, things come up that disturb us. And it will be things from hurting words, from sadness, anger, pessimism, worries, complaints, pressures, bitterness, selfishness, grudges, and from un other unkind words. And we that's where we have that decision point. And it's, it's seemingly such a, a small little point of decision. But we have, in a sense, trained ourselves on some level to think and react to these negative ways. And at first, it, it may it actually take a lot to say consciously, I'm not going to have this internal conversation anymore. I'm going to do its opposite, as Pope Francis has, has suggested that we do. And at first, actually can seem difficult. Like, I really should have this grudge against someone. I really can't, in a sense, forgive in my heart. But then it's a big decision to say, you know, I'm going to give up the grudge. The amazing thing is that the more that we do it, the easier it becomes. 
one thing about this idea of 40 days leading into Easter that a different reading that I've done, 40 days is about the time it takes to completely take on a new way of being, in a sense. Or let's say if you ever gave up smoking, if you could get to day 40, you were probably there. And think about it of anything else, anything else that was positive, a change of behavior in your life. I mean, it could be just about anything. Again, if you got to day 40, you are probably home for you. So think of that in this one. Here, here's what it looks like. Print this out. Put it on your refrigerator. Make multiple copies. Put one in your coat pocket. Um, bring it to Atkinson's when it's full of visitors from out of town. No, no, really, really. They, you know, it's funny how we think spiritual practice is like homing on a cushion. No, it's an Atkinson's. You know, it, it really is. Or, or if any of you live in California, take this to the DMV. Uh, you know, I, I mean, let's let's go for spiritual practice this month. I mean, really, take this to the DMV in, in Los Angeles somewhere. Uh, you will ascend to a higher place. No, but seriously, that's what the shift can be this time of year. These simple, simple ways that will have amazing effects and long-range effects in your life. Regardless of how you judge your own spiritual practice, you will have a sense that you've brought a little bit of heaven down into your peace of mind. So, let's begin this 40 days together. And let's go with it. As we, first of all, express our gratitude for so many things. Our gratitude for life. Our gratitude for being in this amazing community. And our gratitude knowing that at the center of all things is spirit. And in the center, each of us can choose. We can choose to let go. We can choose kind words. We can choose to forgive. We can choose so many things as, take, as we take a step in a different direction of life. And we transform right now. I give thanks for this, this ability, this free 